After years of making violent action pictures and horror films, Robert Rodriguez did something rather unexpected. He crafted a spy movie about children for children, and thus the Spy Kids franchise was launched, a complete ode to child wish fulfillment, loaded with the director's unfiltered imagination. While an imperfect series of films, it's easy to see why Spy Kids caught on in a major way. The plot and ultimate appeal of Spy Kids is rather simple, as it details the Cortez family, the patriarchs of which happen to be spies. When they end up in trouble, it's up to Junie and Carmen to save the day. Rodriguez seems intent on two major things, making Junie and Carmen into a sibling duo children can put themselves into, and showing off his wild ideas. Daryl Sabara and Alexa Vega have really good chemistry, and even some of the sillier aspects of the story they manage to bring a certain charm to. And mark my words, Spy Kids is a silly and odd little film, featuring strange thumb henchmen and other sorts of crazy creations. It's a movie that allows us to buy that Alan Cummings, popular children's show host, has a secret evil operation of robots. Who knew public access television was so lucrative? Speaking of coming, he's also one of the highlights, channeling almost Paul Rubens in his goofy and enthusiastic performance. The various gadgets featured in the movie are inventive, and while the special effects are a tad on the wonky side, you can tell how much fun Rodriguez is having mounting the action set pieces. As I said, this is entirely wish fulfillment, although the film is fairly light on the plot side. Its attempts at character development are rather service level, but as children entertainment goes, Spy Kids is harmless escapism. It's also neat how the film is about an Hispanic family of spies. Rodriguez has had five children, and I get the sense he put some of his own family dynamics into the Cortez family. Oh yeah, and there's also this line that completely set my mind in the many years since I last watched Spy Kids. Oh shit, Taki Mushrooms. You can tell Rodriguez must have been really proud of that line. He even reused it for the sequels. Speaking of which, the success of Spy Kids meant a sequel was inevitable, although I don't think anyone expected it would come out immediately the following year. Spy Kids 2, The Island of Lost Dreams, continues the fantasy aspect of its predecessor by showing how the OSS spy organization managed to recruit a bunch of children for the division. That inventiveness that the first film is noted for continues here, with Rodriguez making this an homage to Lost World stories, specifically the island of Dr. Moreau. There's even a sequence that is a loving tribute to the works of Ray Harryhausen. Does it contribute much to the plot? Not entirely, and that's kind of the central issue with the film, as it takes a rather episodic structure, with Junie and Carmen traveling to this island and ending up in a bunch of situations, either encountering a monster or coming across another hidden secret of the island. The villain's motivation also did not entirely make a lot of sense to me, and I did not much care for the two new spies that are at odds with Junie and Carmen. However, the gadgets are still great fun, I like seeing the interactions between our two lead spy kids, and the action scenes, including the opening and amusement park, have the right childlike whimsy to them. Steve Buscemi is also great as the genetic scientist who lives on the island, providing a surprisingly poignant quote. Do you think God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created? That's probably as deep as you get in these Spy Kids movies, but it's hard not to applaud Rodriguez for throwing that in there, and it does fit with the character's arc. Spy Kids 2 is a fairly standard sequel, choosing to go larger, and it certainly has its fun moments, enough for me to somewhat, almost forgive its flaws. As the title for Spy Kids 3D Game Over suggests, the third entry in the franchise went for a more gimmicky approach. The most enjoyable element of this film is the 3D aspect, and how Rodriguez utilizes the technology to bring the audience into this game world. It's absolutely a gimmick, though, and Rodriguez seems mostly intent on creating incredible video game levels. There's certainly a lot of energy to the action sequences, with the director seemingly putting a lot of his favorite video game concepts into the movie. He also attempts to stretch Sylvester Stallone by having him play multiple roles, although Peter Sellers, he is not. However, you know how I said part of the enjoyment of Spy Kids came from the chemistry between Junie and Carmen? Well, Carmen is hardly in Spy Kids 3D, so that element is lost. Because the child actors are forced to act in front of a green screen the entire time, you can tell how limiting that feels. 
There's something oddly robotic about the acting in this film, and the bizarre charm the dialogue had in the previous films does not entirely register here. Everything is gobbled up by the larger computer-generated world and visuals, so the story ends up lost in the shuffle, and the stakes don't feel entirely high. It really makes one admire how Steven Spielberg managed to pull off this sort of idea with Ready Player One. Even the adult actors feel off in their performances, including Antonio Banderas. The cheesiness factor that was somewhat in balance in the first two Spy Kids movies teeters over in this one. After an eight-year hiatus, Robert Rodriguez returned to the Spy Kids universe with the fourth movie, All the Time in the World. This went back to the silly charm of the first two movies, understanding the appeal was seeing two children go on ridiculous missions. The two new Spy Kids have a solid chemistry, with one of them being hearing impaired, but the film does not treat him any differently for it. I thought that was a nice touch. Junie and Carmen came back fully grown, and it is great to see them older and rather change after years of being apart. Rodriguez even throws in a bit of fan service in a scene where many of the old props are showcased again. And you know he kept many of those in storage, just in case. The humor is slightly hit or miss, with plenty of time puns and an annoying talking robotic dog. There were quite a few points where I just wanted somebody to take out his voice box. The movie also does not do a very good job of hiding its main villain. The spy agency head and one of the baddies are both played by Jeremy Piven. Do you think there's maybe a connection? Uh, yeah, of course there is. However, I have to admit, where they went with the big twist was surprisingly touching. Again, as is the norm in these Spy Kids movies, there is a bit of cheesiness. But repeat after me, what is this series about? Child wish fulfillment, that's right. And Spy Kids, all the time in the world, more than continues that tradition. Oh, and apparently this was shown in smell vision on its original release? I watched Spy Kids 4 on Netflix, so I sadly missed out on the chance to smell dog farts. In the end, the Spy Kids movies maybe don't hold up that much to adult scrutiny, but their popularity among children is definitely understandable, as well as many people's nostalgic affection for them. See you next time.